welcome everyone to this uh, panel today, uh, where I'm really happy that I'm also joined by, by four really great researchers from diverse domains. Um, we've heard uh, two of them today, uh, Frank Gressel from DLR. Uh, we've also heard Felix just before, Felix Schumann from EPFL from the Brewing Project. And uh, we're also joined by uh, Michael Busman from Casus and Neil Sivedi from um, ECMWF, uh, who will be giving a talk tomorrow. So I'll be giving the, the floor to each uh, one of you uh, in just a second. Uh, maybe just a very brief reminder to the audience to please uh, keep your mics off so uh, the speakers can speak. And if time permits, we're already a bit late, so I don't know, uh, maybe there will be also time for a few questions at the end uh, from the audience. Um, and now let me see if I can set up. All right, so uh, please, uh, Michael Guzman, if you would like to present yourself. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy about this annual workshop and I just want to uh, thank again all the speakers uh, presenting today and, and on the other days. So I'm very happy that this worked out and it was a bit uh, our in intention from the side of, of uh, Casus to bring a quite diverse field of people working on digital twins of complex systems together. Um, I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist by training and uh, I've been instrumental in setting up uh, CASUS in the last uh, two years. So we are a very young institute and one of the central things we're looking at is digital twins of complex systems. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, uh, specifically plasma physicist. Uh, my expertise is uh, on the computing side in high performance computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, real time processing, da da da, those things. Um, and uh, I have been very active within the Helmholtz uh, uh, Society in the last four years uh, in terms of digitalization across the research fields of. Uh, uh, Helmholtz, which is the biggest research organization in Europe. And um, in, in these roads, I listed a few roads there. Uh, the the uh, um, subject of dig digital twins actually plays a central role. We heard about the Human Brain Project, where Jülich is involved, of course, very strongly, but also, also others like uh, uh, Digital Earth and, and uh, all the other from the, from the uh, medical perspective, from energy systems perspective from natural uh, uh, perspective. And I think this is a very interesting and timely subject to see uh, where we can find um, commonalities, uh, let it be from computing methods or, or AI methods, but also in general approaches, what do we think is a, constitutes a, a digital twin and how do we make sure that they are uh, really a good representation of what we think the systems we're studying um, are. Yeah, so uh, as I said, I'm very happy uh, about the, the workshop so far and especially about the high level and, and very interesting presentations. Thank you. Okay. So next is Frank Dresso. Yeah. Um... Thank you for the invitation to the discussion. Um, I can continue from uh, what uh, Michael was saying because I am also uh, um, trained in theoretical physics. <laughs> so <laughs> um, after the uh, um, study, I was um, having just a short uh, postdoc time when I was um, going to the IT industry. And um, where I was involved in a lot of um, data management, data warehousing, BI for big customers, and always with the focus on <clears throat> building um, new solutions, um, technology scouting, and um, data science, and with range from um, really doing the full stack development from sensor hardware up to web applications. So really looking at the whole stack and also looking at what the industry and the um, customers needed. And this was quite an interesting um, 
experience because after that I went back to research at the DLR and um, it's really interesting to compare both perspectives, one from side from research and the other one from the um, industry. And from yeah, 2020 on, I'm uh, the uh, current acting head of um, the departments of the methods at our institute. And <clears throat> my main research um, topics were starting from uh, virtual certification, which is an one of the uh, um, research topics in our institute. And as I already said in my, or sketched in the talk, um, the idea is to really do a large portion of the design of new airplanes um, in a digital way. And in the end, <clears throat> really get the okay from the um, EASA for replacing a lot of the currently physical tests with um, simulated one. Uh, by far not all, but um, a large portion of it. And based on that, um, there are a lot of topics which are involved to reach with virtual certification and mainly it's the traceability and provenance of the whole um, simulation pipelines of the digital twins which are involved of the uh, uh, data flow and simulation and yeah, that's my uh, background and I hope I can contribute um, some of this to the um, future discussion. Thank you very much. And next is uh, Felix, if you'd like to say a few words. Yeah, well, I, I mean, thank you very much also for having me. Um, I just spoke, I think part of the um, uh, participants uh, sort of still remember what I talked about. In any case, my name is Felix Schurman. I'm co-director of the Blue Brain project, which is sort of applying simulation science to the study of the brain, building digital twins of brain tissue. It seems that digital twins are a perfect uh, topic to bring physicists together. So I'm a physicist by training as well, not a theoretical physicist. Um, and in my role as co-director, I'm overseeing essentially the computer science and software engineering part of this project, uh, which is about, um, in a way, an, an organization of uh, roughly 60, 70 um, software engineers and computer scientists um, doing methods research and then actually develop uh, production hard software to actually do the, the neuroscience part of, of what we do that ranges from high performance computing from more domain specific algorithms to actually overseeing the running of the, the uh, hardware infrastructure um, and scientific visualization. Thank you very much. And finally, Niels, if you would like to also say a few words. Okay, thank you. Also, thank you, of course, for the invitation to participate in this very interesting discussion. Uh, it seems that, uh, you know, the analysis of these digital twins is certainly very interesting also to see the uh, very common challenges, I would say, across the different disciplines. Um, so a bit of background for me, um, I um, have been trained in theoretical meteorology, um, but indeed I also hold a PhD in physics from the LMU in Munich. And I have been working now for 25 years at ECMWF. This is a European center for medium range weather forecasts in Reading, but now being a multi-site organization across uh, Reading, Bonn, and Bologna. And uh, indeed, now I am currently the head of the Earth System Modeling section, which uh, takes care of uh, the design of the model, the design of model uncertainty with respect to ensemble runs and uh, all aspects of coupling to ocean, waves, sea ice, and atmosphere, of course, and the land surface. And, uh, but I will change my role now, and I will become the digital technology lead for Destination Earth. Destination Earth is, um, you know, obviously I hope you will come to my talk tomorrow, but it will be um, a new initiative from the European Union, part of the Green Deal, to essentially build a replica of our Earth system and its interaction with, um, you know, human activity. And um, yeah, I'd like to share more about this with you tomorrow. Cool, thank you very much. So it seems that I'm the only non-physicist here in this group. I'm a computer scientist, which is very befitting, so I can learn from a bunch of physicists. I think that's perfect. 
Okay. Um, so on to the question. So I, I wanted to actually start the question round um, with, with, with maybe a, a, like a quick intro question, um, which is maybe posed in a deliberately provocative way. Um, and I'll just make the round uh, uh, to all of you. And, um, and I'll start with, uh, with Niels. Um, so the question is, so, so to you, digital twins, is, is that really a universal concept or, or is it more uh, just a bag of tricks uh, that is applied to your domain? For me, it is a more universal, um, I think, concept. I think, um, you know, there's clearly a range of outcomes and, and sort of forward-looking changes with respect to, say, the tools and the workflows that we are interested in and that we, you know, the ways we would like to communicate ultimately with a whole range of different users. So, so this will be uh, lasting whether the principal universal concept of digital twin will function or not. But, uh, but it has um, a new element, basically, compared to, say, our standard production of numerical weather prediction or our standard production of climate information, because it has this element of, of interaction, more elements of how can we assess uncertainty. And, and so it's like, a, you know, the, the, I guess the universality of this concept perhaps is, is like a partner, you know, a partner, a sparring partner where you can sort of toy ideas and, and actually help this complex decision process of climate adaptation, for example. Cool. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Felix? No, I think, I mean, the mere fact that actually we essentially have different domains present here talking about digital twins, I think is, is testimony to the fact that I think it helps us to um, name a certain methodology in our research that we share amongst each other. And I think that shows that it's, it's universal to some degree. I, I'm a little bit um, fearing that it, um, it's, it's a subset of the type of computational domain science we do. That sort of, I think the, the set of computational problems um, that we do are not all kind of culminating in the digital twins. I mean, there's actually things to be learned by sort of doing data analysis, good old uh, neuroinformatics or something, or uh, direct machine learning of some models which just do prediction as we just heard and sort of aren't of this interactive type. And especially for the brain, sometimes we actually look at the function and we ask the question, oh, what's the algorithm for intelligence? And then we look back at what's the real tissue doing. So I think my only word of caution would be is that sort of I think the digital twins shouldn't dominate the, the sort of the, um, what is the output of all our computational field. But otherwise, I think it's really it's a, it's a very useful, clean concept, which I think we can all uh, uh, relatively easily relate to. So Frank, I remember from your talk earlier this afternoon, you were also saying digital twins. Well, it depends a little bit, maybe in the domain of, of manufacturing and, and, and products there, or oh, there is also some some marketing speech that goes in, in there. But but maybe you want to expand a little bit on this and, and, and add some more. Yeah, I I would say it's also some kind of um, concept, especially on how we use what we can get out from our simulation and our uh, process workflows. And I mean, although I said it's some kind of marketing term, um, I would say it always depends on what the people would like to do with it. Because um, I mean, if a very simple system, which is essentially just a data management system, helps someone to solve this problem, uh, may it be in industry, may it be in research, it's totally fine. and um if we call it a digital twin yeah may it be the case but i think what um neil said in the beginning the interactivity is really a feature which most people or creators of digital twin uh would say it's an essential feature and that's i think really something which changed in the last years that we not just using the results of our digital processes as something virtual, but really try to connect it to um, real things, to real objects, to machines, to our devices. And yeah, maybe it will change in the future, but I think with interactive interactivity and also in our understanding that it belongs together, the virtual world and the real world uh, will stay. And finally to Michael, um... So what is what is your stance? 
Difficult question, tough question, actually. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I, I think it helps to, to convey a concept where we bring in interaction with the real world together with simulation data. And so it's a real, it's a real bunch of things. And I really like Felix's overview picture when he introduced himself today because I have very similar pictures lying around actually quite a lot of those that, that look very similar. And I think in the, in, in the first place, it's a lot of technologies that we are bringing together that have not yet been used together in a concise way to create something new. So there's a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of handy work to do. And this is maybe not so visionary uh, because we just have to do it. And, and it just means a lot of work. Um, on the other hand, I think we are just starting to understand what this bridge between the virtual world and the real world could do potentially and how we how we stronger connect those things and how we get feedback, how we use sensors that are out there in the real world and steer them to get feedback from what we know on the environment and so on. So all these things that that might be there in the future. And I think it's a process to understand uh, how this concept of digital twins will involve in the future. And so it's a very long-term development for me, actually. It's a very long-term development and we will learn what digital twins mean in the future. We're not there yet, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, okay. So maybe we can expand a little bit on that um, because I mean, as I said, I mean, you, you have different backgrounds, different domains, and you're all working with digital twins in, 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 a sort, in, in, your, in your domain. And so what I'm wondering, which I think expands a little bit on this point that, that you just made, uh, uh, Michael, um, is, is specifically about the challenges. Um, I think um, both Felix and Frank have today already pointed out some of those challenges, um, but but I, I I think we can maybe go a little bit more in depth on this question. And so what I'm wondering is um, for each one of you, and and then uh, and then you can you can discuss also what do you think are maybe the one or two main uh, technical challenges uh, that that you uh, see for developing digital twins um, in your area. Um, and maybe we can uh, this time start the round uh, with uh, with Frank, let's say. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of challenges, <laughs> but um, to um, let's say from the main point of view, it's definitely a um, performance issue, both in coupling the uh, different um, disciplines which are involved in aviation and also um, to gain the accuracy we need. Um, from the technical um, point of view, where uh, my interest is um, in, it's definitely on how to um, understand the digital twins. And I mean, in the talk, I was um, talking about how to understand the data, but it goes a lot more deeper because we are applying a lot of tools and algorithms um, where we cannot really be sure what we are doing. I mean, we are having our real form software development. We have our tests. Uh, we have our unit tests. We have our software engineering guidelines and so on and so forth. Um, but especially with the uh, um, usage of a lot of advanced AI tools available, um, what is possible, I think, in the future are things like automated um, source code analysis. And there are already some first prototypes around but uh, this needs to be extended to really understand what's going on in the source code level to get really some, um, let's say some boundaries on what we can expect from our algorithms um, and uh, make sure we will work correctly even under very strange input um, ranges. And uh, Niels, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I, I share the view that there are clearly many implementation and, and implementing challenges to start with, uh, in particular in view of, uh, you know, probably like in every other discipline as well, the complexity in our case of Earth system modeling and, uh, and in fact, the inherent uncertainty around um, this, this system. So uh, there, this leads then to, um, you know, not 
selling digital twins as the answer, the big brother that you can ask the question and, you know, you will always have the right answer because in a way um, it is just helping you as a, as an additional element of, of uh, managing basically a really multi criteria uh, decision process. And therefore um, I think one of the big challenges is actually managing uh, the interaction with those users and actually actually leveling in a way also the expectations um, and and uh, and in fact translating the complexity of of our domain to say decision makers that are not expert in this particular domain but expect I think at the moment like uh, this this gives you the answer and then I can take a decision so um, so I think there's some some work there also you will have users with a whole range of different expertise in fact with different access patterns to this complex data so you need to manage as you also on a technical level the access patterns to this to this data you know some will, will really want to dive into the absolute details others want to aggregate one they maybe just like uh, accumulated counts of events or, or thresholds or you know things like this so it'll be very very different um how people might want to use the information and uh, yeah, and ultimately also, of course, uncertainty quantification, uh, the cost of uncertainty quantification is huge, uh, at least in our domain. And, and, um, and uh, you know, getting actually a good handle on uncertainty quantification is still also a science question. So, so I'm, I'm also fully with the previous speaker that, um, you know, I'm a great believer in hierarchical models, also simple models and, and actually building, building up knowledge and nothing goes away with us building now these digital twins. I think you know all these science uh, disciplines have their validity and and their absolute use. It's just another facet, if you like, in this hierarchy of of models that we're trying to build up. Yeah, yeah that's actually a really good point. I mean, the use of these digital twins. I mean, it, it's it's very important to understand who is actually using them and then to 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 deliver that data in an understandable way. Um, Felix, you you in your talk you you were you were talking a lot about scales and 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 the different scales that need to be taken into account in such systems. One thing that that struck me and that I mean I know also from the work that we do is is if we want to achieve a real time simulation, there's still very large challenges, especially if we're going to really large scales. So maybe do you want to go a little bit into that aspect? Um. Yeah, I mean, before I go to real time, sorry, <laughs> um, I, I just wanted. To, I think there there was an interesting theme of the sort of the commonality of the challenges in digital twins, and I think it actually boils down in the end to complexity. That complexity is hard, no matter what, whether it's digital or in the real world, and it's hard to sort of um, take measure it and take parameters out to build your digital twins. Right, I was speaking about that. And the multi-physics and the atmosphere and climate, it's the same thing, right? I mean, you can't measure all of that. So it's it's complexity, heterogeneity, and sort of that's the measure, that's the part. And then I think that that complexity sort of then just propagates downstream and then or everything. And actually, in the fact that we then have to represent that complexity because aggregating and simplifying it is not simple because it actually is complex, right? And therefore, so it doesn't sort of just aggregate, and not at least not in all cases to something nice and, and simple, which leads you to this computational complexity, which is just, I think, a, a stunning challenge. Now, again, we're putting these uh, fantastic computers to good use. So I think in that sense, I think it's a good match. But at the end of the day, um, we are really, um, I think if you have a complex system, um, you will have a complexity will be a challenge no matter what, even experimentally, because you can only cut through that system in so many finite ways because you run out of time or a PhD students or whatever. Um, so in that sense, it's not that this is, and I think it needs to be noted that so the digital twins aren't the saviors to sort of suddenly simplify this complexity, but it's still a fantastic way to keep all these running parts and pieces sort of interacting to kind of see the non-trivial sides of them. But I think at the end of that, I mean, then even as you said, the organization who's asking the question, is it a legitimate question? Are you even within your realm of your model? I mean, all of that is, I think, rooted in this complexity. So I think digital twins bring a new framework or a very useful framework to study of complex systems. But I think it's actually the, the challenge don't go away from, from it. I think that's what I, what I take. And that's probably really the, the commonality. Now, to your question of, of real time, um, I don't see real time of brain tissue at the level as I was describing it um, as the goal and I don't think it's necessarily needed I mean unless you actually would be really coupling it to a real brain or a real interaction putting it on a robot um, then of course you would have to kind of uh, have the computations come back in some boundedness 
for doing all these types of studies, I mean, we can afford to have a certain experiment run a little bit slower, not exactly real time. Now, so that's the easy way out. I think it's it's just hard. I think the way I see technology going, that I probably can't have it all. I can't have sort of all the level of detail um, um, in my models and sort of have the computation come back in real time. So I would have to make some compromises, which for some cases, I mean, putting a brain on a robot might actually, maybe I don't need all of that biochemical and biophysical detail, right? To have the robot navigate. And then I'm lucky if it turns out that I need all of the detail, then I think real time will be um, a, a tough challenge. Um, and I don't see technology right now developing in a way that that uh, the strong scaling aspect of, of large systems would be sufficiently soon addressed. I think it's it's a hard problem. Yeah, this reminds me actually exactly what I was aiming for. Um, and uh, finally, um, Michael, would you like yeah. to add? I wanted to address also the, the, the problem of real time. Uh, as, as a physicist at the large large scale research facilities like huge accelerators and, and stuff like this, we are pretty much used to reduce the information we get from these by factors of 10 to the four or 10 to the five already. And almost almost in uh, actually in real time because we, we cannot handle the complexity and we're currently reducing it by, by prior prior knowledge, but this will change since the um, systems we're looking at become more complex. And with more complexity, uh, stupid and easy and fast reduction becomes a real challenge, meaning that we need to bring in uh, expert knowledge by people or by something else uh, uh, to, to deal with the large amount of really high quality data we have. Uh, I, I want to address the the, uh, the 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 perils and 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 virtues of, of digital twins a bit more in the sense what happens if we actually have them, because then there will be be two things. First of all, if we're doing our job well, we will have at, at some level a very similar com complexity to the real world. So this means we're building like a library. A living library of our knowledge as a as a large model of and we combine all the knowledge from the different fields together to something that maybe none of the creators of this understands in full and so the question is what do we do with that are we are we certain that what we have built is is very similar to to what we observe in nature or we or are we talking about our own uh, uh, missing knowledge, and and I think that's both the 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 challenge and and also something that really appeals to me in terms of digital twins that we bring in all this knowledge and see how it works. And to me, finally, the interaction with the single researcher, because we will still have single researchers, we will have PhD students, we will have professors, we will have research teams with, with specific research questions. And enabling them to use these tools, both in a quantitative way, so really make quantitative studies, but also in an explorative way, so in a creative way, how to really understand what they're looking at, finding new views. Uh, this is this is such an enormous field and, and even, even I'm not, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I, I haven't finished yet and what the possibilities could be and, and what is the best way to interact with those systems. But I'm pretty sure it will also definitely mean computational wise to better understand complexity measures. So once we have a digital twin of a system, just by creating this twin, we will understand the system better in a mathematical way. I'm pretty sure about that. Actually, so my, uh, it's kind of fitting well with the questions because uh, my, my next question kind of connects also to this, it connects also a little bit to, to, to the, the, the theme that we had a little bit before with, with, with Felix, um, um, which is, um, which is talking a little bit about this complexity and how to tune this complexity or how to compute, uh, tune the level of detail. So in recent years, as we all know, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence have been extremely successful. Um, they've been so successful that, that researchers um, in diverse domains started looking more and more into 
into re they start rethinking their modeling and their simulation and integrating AI into into these uh, into these pipelines. So uh, physics informed neural networks comes to mind. Uh, um, may maybe the talk uh, by Attila Fangi on, on Monday uh, would be one example of, of this type of work. And, and so my question uh, to you all is, uh, so where do you think uh, this, this will go uh, um, specifically for, for digital twins? Um, do, you, do you think that, that one, one will have to go much more uh, uh, data-driven, um, AI-driven, or we would have to stay still much closer to the theory, first principles, or, or maybe somewhere in between? Uh, and this time, maybe let's let's uh, start with uh, Michael. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> first, first of all, um, I'm I, uh, start starting with uh, I'm a numerics guy by by starting. So my my I started out with with hard stuff, numerics, uh, convergence, PDEs, and so on. So I, I really like to know how, how well my model fits to what I'm looking at, you know, and having hard numbers on it. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, a lot of technologies that have been developed in the last five years just due to immense uh, 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 funding and also also boost in technologies are very helpful and I sometimes find it funny because some things like physics informed neural networks or convergence of, of neural net uh, studying convergence of neural networks and so on now now circle back to actually standard numeric questions and and how to deal with those uh, explainable AI and stuff like that and I think it's a very valid thing to create data driven models and use them and especially to, to encapsulate, not, not generally reduce, but sometimes just encapsulate uh, complexity that we have not fully understood yet, but that we can integrate in, in our models. But we have to be aware that we maybe not fully understand what we're integrating. And to me, it science is all about finally, but I'm a physicist, so that's fine understanding first principles, understanding underlying connections and formulating those in a mathematical sense. But something like a digital twin goes sometimes into the direction that we can't do this for the whole system. And I would highly doubt that we ever can do this. So we will always have parts of the system that we understand better and parts of the system that are for now black boxes that do something when we wiggle with them. That would be my answer for now, and I don't have a better answer right now. Oh, I mean, <laughs> um, well, let, let's see what Felix thinks about that, since his talk was about biophysically detailed uh, uh, models. And yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a it's a good question in the sense that I think on the one end I think we are envious. I mean, there are some great successes of turning Navier-Stokes equation integration into something much faster and accurate uh, with using the right machine learning techniques, and I think. None of us can close their eyes in front of that and so say, hey, maybe we can have uh, accelerate some of our computations in that way. And I think a little bit, as Michael just said, I mean, if that's well confined in sort of certain parts where sort of anyways, we're doing some integration, we're not particularly proud. I mean, we know the equation, but sort of integrating it and it's so, so precise doing numerics. Uh, I think these machine learning models might actually do a fairly good job. So I think for accelerating some of the execution, I think none of us can ignore that. So I think clearly this this um, approaches will clearly creep into this more traditional first principle simulation. That said, um, thinking about it from the other way, I think the issue of complex systems is they are complex because of the many moving parts, <laughs> the interacting parts, and the heterogeneity. And I think if you if you simplify too much um, of that. I think you lose the power of these digital twins in the sense that so you can no longer track that element or that parameter to the overall systems behavior. And so in the in the brain, I think one of the key things is that in, in the US sort of US brain initiative is, has run the cell census um, program, which is one currently one of the highest funded neuroscience program. It's about finding out what types of cells there are in the brain and genetically 
characterizing them. And the more and more we look at that, the more and more we realize that there's many of them, there's a diversity, and on the other hand, they're very relevant for different diseases. So essentially, if you aggregate over them, you'll lose the capability to sort of link that type of cell to your system's behavior. So um, where I think that this is leading us, that there is sort of um, a memory problem in these complex systems that sort of you do need to represent these things in a certain type of resolution. Again, whatever they are, for us, these are neurons. For, uh, I'm sure for climate, there are other elements that you need, I mean, I don't know, uh, cells of the planet. You do need to track. If you don't do that, you actually lose sort of the ability to link that causally to the system's behavior. And I think there, these black boxes actually do not help us. I mean, they're not turning that these numbers of parameters that we need in order to kind of keep that, that uh, these many pieces, they're not reducing the memory. So I think we actually will run into a memory problem, whether we do machine learning or theory based. And I think there's not a lot of free lunch, or you have to kind of simplify and you accept the simplification. So in that sense, I think for this very type of systems with many different heterogeneous parts, there's a somehow a natural level of sort of how much this data-driven can go. Again, useful tool to simplify some computations, but I think not necessarily uh, uh, all um, in tool to kind of uh, deal with the complexity because I think simply you have to maintain some of that. So I think there's a there's a natural, well, this label it might be different for different domains, but I think it will not take over fully because I think otherwise we actually lose the, the actual power of these digital twins for those complex systems. Thank you. What's your opinion, Niels? Um, yeah, I mean, like, it, obviously, I don't think it's going to take over. But um, um, I, I think in numerical weather prediction, um, we there is a very close affinity, I think, has been for a long time with respect to, say, machine learning um, approaches and what we call data simulation. Because um, in order to establish, basically, a very good initial state for your forecast going forward, um, you really need to sample, basically, the many different observations and the multivariate nature of those observations and um, and bring it basically into a format that is consistent with the equations that you're trying to solve. So, so I, I think this has many, and in fact, there are papers that really describe how this is, um, you know, there's a very close affinity between, say, the machine learning approaches and data simulation. It's kind of, you know, synonymous in a way. So, uh, and we appreciate, I think, in our domain at least, that this this is very very powerful. This is very useful, and um, and we um, you know obviously want to make even more use out of this going going forward into the future. But um, but it's clear that uh, you know the model cannot live without all these observations and making a good forecast. But at the same time, machine learning cannot live without very good data. And, uh, and there is not enough good data for the problems that we face. So therefore, um, really, you know, advancing modeling and, and, and basically, you know, using perhaps digital twins also to produce data, which subsequently then can be augmenting data-driven approaches um, is, is a very exciting opportunity. And, and the other element I think is, um, you know, like there's obviously then the, the set downscaling approach and like, you know, post-processing and things, which is also very heavily used now in, in meteorology and, and weather where, you know, you can map maybe precipitation using machine learning to local areas. And, and that's kind of almost a given now, but there's another exciting opportunity. And that's sort of what NVIDIA, for example, like proposes is that we, we build this model, basically digital twin, but then we replicate it with, with machine learning approaches, basically. So, so you would emulate what you've built in a way, but then you can use it multiple times very fast. And, and that's another exciting approach, I think, that we see where you know, the two can work together, basically. But it's, it will be a, you know, a symbiosis between, say, machine learning uh, approaches and, and uh, continuing to evolve the best possible models that, that we can build. OK. And so, so you mean? That would, that would be, for example, for ensemble runs or things like that, where you then could run many, many instances much faster. For example, exactly. Okay. Or if you need a, you know, if you need a, in time critical situations, for example, um, like in NWP or time critical, you only have literally always one hour. And, you know, at some point we will, um, you know, we want to build the resolution so much and the ensemble members so much that we can't fit it into the one hour anymore. And, and so machine learning could maybe emulate our models faster in that within that one hour 
but then you have the other 23 hours to kind of you know run your normal models basically in order to feed the next um say time critical slot so that's another opportunity and finally yeah i think it depends a little bit on the use case so um for example when you are looking at things like predictive maintenance where you just want to schedule your next maintenance interval it's totally fine if you use all the uh, data all the sensors you have available put it in a black box machine learning model and live with you have to check in two days um because you don't need to understand what's um, going on. You just um, need a, as good estimate as possible. Um, but if you try to learn something about the system where you are building the uh, digital twin for, um, I would say, as um, Michael and the others already said, you have to go more in the uh, theory side and really try to formalize what's going on. And um, where you maybe wouldn't like to use black box um, approaches like most of the data-driven um, models. What I think, and that's something uh, we uh, are looking at for some of the um, problems, is the combination of both that you have, for example, um, very detailed physics-based simulations where you still know where is some deviation to reality, which you cannot formalize yet because maybe you don't have the knowledge for that and where you try to um, somehow characterize the difference to the reality to experiments with some kind of uh, data-driven methods artificial intelligence um, to just make your models better so you still have your basic understanding of what's going on based on the theory and when you have with extra accuracy based on some um, black box um, models. That's, I think, um, where both um, methods will be combined in the future. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we're actually already a little bit over time. Um, I had another question, but I think I'll have to cut it a little bit short. I think I'll make it very short. Um, I hope that's okay with you. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do that. So. Um, maybe just to set a little bit the stage still to, to, to say, you know, what this is about. So, uh, okay, I, I, I come from HPC. So for me, HPC technology, hardware technology is very interesting. And so if we're looking now uh, a little bit into the future, we see that at least traditional um, uh, uh, computing as we know it and CPUs, uh, performance is starting to flatten out and we don't know where exactly this will go. I mean, people are predicting that in five to 10 years, there's, there's, there's gonna be some limits that will come. Um, and so um, now, now a question to all of you, um, if you could pick one alternative technology, and there's a bunch of things that are around now um, in network computing, in memory computing, maybe domain specific architectures, things like that, uh, neuromorphic. Um, if you could pick uh, uh, one such technology that you think digital twins would benefit from, which one would that be? And, and maybe we can close with that. That could be kind of your closing uh, statement. And uh, we can start uh, with Felix. This is not a single one sentence question, but if you force me to, um, I'm in my hands, I have a memory constraint problem in terms of memory capacity, memory bandwidth, because essentially my system is utterly complex and it's going to grow. So I don't think that quantum, even neuromorphic, none of that will actually solve that memory problem. I think we actually have to push further on memory. And even though CPUs might flatten out, I think memory has still some time to go. So my bet would be on smart and memory computing where you actually can uh, reduce the, the, the way between the data and where the computer is happening and intersperse that. And I would hope these systems will come. I'm not entirely sure because I'm, we are not the ones ordering these systems. I mean, they're built for other purposes. So I'm not entirely sure the technology will go that way, but I would like to sort of see these memory type computing systems. I think that would serve us in our domain best. Uh, Michael, what would be your wish list? Uh, I, I would buy the same stuff Felix would be buying first because we're facing the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> So we should maybe order together. Um, the, the other thing I would say, you're, you're looking at computing. And my after, after a lot of time in HPC, 
I have learned that I have to live what the big companies uh, produce and even talking to them, they, they listen, they really listen, but I'm never getting what I want. So I have to live with what is there. Uh, so, so my perspective is where we have to invest and where we can invest and where we don't really invest right now is to uh, make the human machine interface on every level better from, from uh, programming those things to the data analytics, to the simulation, to the visualization. And we really, really have to invest there because the other thing is driven by big companies and big money. We don't have as scientists, even as big, uh, uh, big, big uh, societies and so on. We can't really drive the market there, but where we can make make future predictions and future ideas happening is in how to use these things much 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 better and i think a console is not the way to go <laughs> so uh, but otherwise if felix says this please send me a email i would love to have that <laughs> we'll let you know <laughs> um what about you frank yeah, I think it really, <clears throat> again, depends on what you would like to um, do and what your use case it is. So it may be uh, the in-memory um, technology, it may be quantum computing, and for sure many new <laughs> technologies will emerge. Um, I think it really it really depends on uh, what you are doing and how you are using um, the system. So I wouldn't vote for one of them, at least not on my wish list. I would like to look at all of them. <laughs> Do benchmarks and then see what, what will work. All right. And so finally, uh, Niels, what would be your wish list? Um, well, actually, it's difficult to pin it down to a particular um, processing architecture, to be honest, because, uh, you know, in the next five to 10 years, we actually see a huge diverse range. And in fact, the, the challenge is to adapt to all of them. Uh, and because we have invested, uh, you know, in, in millions lines of code and, and, you know, aggregated knowledge over 30, 40 years, which uh, we need to um, move between different platforms that will be available. And in fact, um, the trends clearly go towards, um, you know, once you kind of uh, optimize for one, you de-optimize possibly for another one. So, so basically, um, you know, we are looking at approaches that actually avoid these kind of scenarios. So, so for us, I think the most important is um, that these uh, emerging processing architectures fit into an HPC ecosystem that, um, you know, basically is usable for our diverse and complex data and compute workflows. And, um, and this includes, of course, the memory hierarchies includes like the different, um, you know, computing devices that are available, um, but, but really, how they apply, we saw this with GPUs, for example. I mean, initially, you know, people came out with specialized kind of, you know, adaptations to GPUs, but now we are seeing the emergence of like uh, the Alps computer where basically CPU and GPU have a sort of common view of the memory infrastructure, for example. And, and uh, you know, what the quantum computer will go in a similar way. You know, initially only very few people will be able to use it, but hopefully at some point it will be integrated in such a way that it becomes more usable for, for applications, you know, complex applications like, like ours. And, and I, that's where I really see the, you know, the challenge, how, how does it fit in basically, because it will, it will not solve all the algorithms for weather and climate, but it might be good for some. All right, thank you very much. Yes. Um, yeah, with that, I think we have reached uh, the end of this panel. So thank you once again, uh, Felix, Frank, uh, Niels and, and Michael for joining me and for having this nice discussion. And uh, yes, and with that, I would like to hand over to the organizers, to Michael, uh, to, uh, to Philip, I think.